This must be narrowly drawn to protect the liberty and autonomy rights. And there must be clear safeguards to prevent abuse. So such laws must be proportional and tailored to the person's circumstances. They must apply for the shortest time possible. And they must be subject to regular review by a competent, impartial authority. Article 14 of the Convention recognizes the right of the disabled to liberty and security of persons on an equal basis with others. It states most notably that the existence of a disability shall in no case justify a, depri a deprivation of liberty. The Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has boldly interpreted this provision as it applies to psychiatric detention by saying that even if other reasons for detention are offered, for example, a person needs care and treatment, but mental or intellectual disability is among the reasons for detention, that detention is discriminatory and in violation of Article 14. Addressing the issue of involuntarily, involuntary treatment, mandatory treatment, is Article 17 of the Convention, which says that every person with disabilities has a right to respect for his or her physical and mental integrity on an equal basis with others. Also relevant is Article 25D, which says that health professionals are to provide care of the same quality to persons with disabilities as to others, including on the basis of free and informed consent. These articles read together deem any law that allows for automatic involuntary treatment as flagrant breaches of obligations under the CRPB. So our Mental Health Act falls short. Why is this? Well, the definition of mental illness in our act is the first clue of its deficiency. It defines a mentally ill person as one suffering from a disorder of mind that he requires care, supervision, treatment, and control for their own or others' protections or welfare. This model is as medical modeled as they come, placing the disability solely within the individual literally requiring treatment and control of that individual for their own good. This definition sets the framework for the rest of the act, which mostly is a series of different options for involuntarily detaining a mentally ill person. For example, Section 7 authorizes the involuntary admission of an urgent admission patient if the proposed patient is mentally ill and in need of detention for the health, safety and protection of the patient and others. Here we see that mental illness is the stated basis for detention, along with the need for care and treatment and the protection of others. This, as we stated earlier, is exactly what the High Commissioner said Article 14 of the CRPD prohibits. Our legislation clearly needs to be reworked to set out non-discriminatory criteria for detention. Further, to ensure that it is non-discriminatory, a law for involuntary detention should apply to everyone, not only those with mental disabilities. <laughs> also problematic is the use of safety or protection of others as a criteria for detention. This is an undesirable inclusion because, as has been demonstrated by several studies, psychiatrists and other medical practitioners are not able to make accurate predictions of a person's risk of harm to themselves or others. The result is that the use of a dangerousness criteria to validate detention condones the involuntary confinement of many mentally ill people who will never be dangerous for the reason of protecting others from their dangerousness. This is not only an unacceptable infringement on the right to liberty, but it reinforces a negative stereotype of the mentally ill, that they are dangerous and that often is not the reality. Another failure of the Mental Health Act is the absence of any requirement for informed consent to treatment. This betrays an assumption that persons with mental illness are incapable of giving informed consent. Not only is such a presumption explicitly unacceptable under the CRPD, but clinical research in other parts of the world 
has proven that even some involuntarily admitted patients have capacity to consent to treatment. The fact that the TT Mental Health Act doesn't require consent to treatment for the voluntarily admitted patient either, even more pointedly shows an assumption of incapacity on the basis of mental illness. A person with mental illness is taken seriously only in their decision to seek admission. After that, they become a passive, incapable recipient of medical treatment. This dismissive and fickle approach to the mentally disabled was unacceptable before the CRPD and doubly unacceptable now. Thus, we urgently need to create legislation setting out fair, appropriate criteria and procedure for involuntary treatment. A recent case in Trinidad and Tobago demonstrates the still prevalent attitude in our society that persons with disabilities must be locked up as the need for our laws to be modernized. This was the case in Cheryl Miller versus the NWRHA. This case concerned an employee of the government whose co-workers and supervisors found her behavior to be odd and fearing mental illness took steps to have her detained at a mental facility against her will. The case was argued under the Mental Health Act, which provides for detention of persons believed to be suffering from mental illnesses where found wandering on a highway or a public place. The case was argued on very legalistic grounds, especially considering specifically whether a desk in a ministry is a public place and whether a person seated at her desk could be said to be wandering. Unfortunately, the court didn't attempt to explore issues of legal capacity or autonomy, regrettable, particularly in light of the state's obligations under the CRPD. It also failed to take opportunity to offer any direction or policy, even obiter, which means at the side, not the substantive judgment, as to how persons with psychosocial illnesses or intellectual disorders should be accommodated or treated at the workplace. This is despite the fact that Trinidad and Tobago has an Equal Opportunity Act, which addresses disability and employment. This act was neither mentioned nor explored. So now I want to discuss the second thing, which is the extent to which the CRPD enables the true participation and inclusion of the disabled in the society. So we're shifting away from mental illness and autonomy. The philosophical thrust of the CRPD with respect to disability issues may be regarded as inherently dualistic. On the one hand, all persons are due as are seen as deserving the right to dignity and equality like any other person, regardless of mental or physical disability. On the other hand, the CRPD recognizes that in order to achieve genuine equality for persons with disabilities, it is often necessary to adopt a different and higher standard of treatment for such persons, employing in its broadest sense the principle of reasonable accommodation, which is now trite law. These framing principles have formed the bedrock of the jurisprudence of international law on disability and are embedded under Article 5 of the CRPD in its expression of the general principle of equality and non-discrimination. It is only through this approach of granting special protection, affirmative duties, and other accommodation to the disabled that we can achieve their effective enjoyment of rights. This is an underlying, though silent, principle under Article 9 of the CRPD, which speaks to accessibility to services and facilities to enable the person living with disabilities to achieve genuine equality. In the case of the physically disabled, this might mean a physical infrastructure to enable the disabled to access work every day. But this is the minimum standard. At the modern workplace, this should mean more than a ramp, but might include equipped computers, etc. In the case of persons with mental disabilities, it might require a supportive network. This would also include the rethinking of what work can be done and the time taken to accomplish tasks, such that traditional ideas of work week and work hours might need to be recalibrated for that category of employee. Our legislative infrastructure has unfortunately not kept pace with our internal op international obligations in the area of disability rights and accommodation, similar to our laws on mental health. 
There is now some more evidence of a more progressive public policy fueled by the international human rights arena, which offers guiding principles to shape the national agenda. But even so, there are significant gaps in policy, particularly where newer issues continue to challenge existing rights frameworks. Even basic issues and principles stated in our statutes are little understood and are not elaborated on or even tested before the courts. For example, Section 14 of the Trinidad and Tobago Equal Opportunities Act provides for the principle of accommodation, a positive obligation placed on employers to make reasonable provision to facilitate or accommodate a person with disabilities who is otherwise qualified to perform the job. However, the meaning of this principle is opaque to those who have the power to take advantage of it. Indeed, it is unclear whether citizens or even the courts are aware of this core obligation. More particularly, the limits of the law, that is, the notion of unjustifiable hardship as a point after which the employer is no longer obligated to accommodate the worker, is a bare statement which has weak supportive concepts or analysis to give it flesh. Yes, the principle of accommodation is limited, but what does that mean in the workplace? Certainly, economic and other circumstances of the employer are to be taken into account. But since these are untested notions in the courts, and there has been little public discourse on these issues, the parameters are unclear. We wish to end on a positive note, drawing your attention to a landmark local case which gives a glimmer of hope that the rights perspective embodied in the CRPD